Have you ever had this happen to you? And as I describe what happened to me a couple weeks ago, you might say, well, Mr. Mitchell, you're too young to have that occur, but it happens to all of us at some point in time, even those of us who are young. But I went to the supermarket to get something, and I turned down an aisle and I stopped and asked myself, what am I here for? And in asking that question, I had to backtrack to figure out why I was here. When my wife had, was preparing dinner and wanted to get something from the store, I went to the store, went down that aisle, and that's when I forgot. But by backtracking from the source, getting to where I was at that time helped me remember, oh yes, and looking up at the sign, yes, I remember what I'm here for, and I go and, co and I got whatever it is that I was trying to collect at that time. May not have been in a store, but somewhere else, and I think most of us can think of a time when we stopped in our tracks and asked, what, what is it I'm here for? What am I supposed to do? Well, I want us to consider that question with regard to today, with regard to now. Over the years, we've heard the question, why are you here? I want us to ask that question relating to today, here, now. In fact, personalize it. Ask, why am I here? If you want a title, title of this message is the Sabbath. Why am I here? In that question, why am I here, are four important words. And focusing on those words help us answer that question for ourselves and will help us de determine, determine what activity, what places are appropriate for the Sabbath. First word is why. Why am I here? Second word is I. Why am I here? I said four words, three words. And the third word is here. Why am I here? Is the Sabbath just like any other busy day of the week? Or is there a difference? Instead of hustling to get to work, are we hustling to get to church? Do our children un understand and feel that the Sabbath is different than the other days of the week? Are the routines the same? Is there no difference? Is the Sabbath the same as the previous six days and will be the same as the next six days? Or is the Sabbath different? Well, of course, the Sabbath is a big, big subject, and we're just going to cover the Sabbath from that question. Why am I here focusing on those three contexts? Why, I, and here. So why the Sabbath? Where did it come from? It wasn't created by some society. It wasn't created by some religious group. Yes, it was created, and we read of that creation in Genesis. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And let's start in verse 1. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. So we see that God created 
lights and separated darkness and defined the first day from evening and morning, evening to evening. And if we read the rest of chapter 1, we see the definition of a day, the evening and the morning. Today, in today's society, we go midnight to midnight. If you went out in the streets and asked someone, when is the day, they'll tell you from midnight to midnight, indicating the bookmarks of time that represents a day. Similar here, God is showing us that a day is from evening, sunset, to the end of the day, the next sunset. Verse 6, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. So in the ensuing days, God creates Creatures, birds, mammals, animals, in, in, on the sixth day, he also created Adam and Eve. Let's go down to the end of chapter 1, verse 31. Genesis 1, verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So six days have passed. And now chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And then God did two important things here, significant things here. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his works which God had created and made. Now you can jot down Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 where we read that the Lord God, creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. So God rested not because he was tired, but there was something important about that day that must be important for you and for me. We read that God then blessed the seventh day, the Hebrew word, for blessed is Barak, which means to praise, to salute, to kneel, implying blessing. I'm going to read from a couple commentaries about the use of this word. From Adam Clark's commentary, referring to God bless the seventh day. The original word, Barak, which is generally rendered to, to mean bless, has a very extensive meaning. It is frequently used in scripture in the sense of speaking good of or good to a person. So it literally means in the Septuagint, from good or from well, of, of which I speak. So this commentary says, so God spoke well of the Sabbath. God spoke well of the Sabbath. It is not a burden. It is not an inconvenience. It is not meant to take away fun and to make people miserable. God has a purpose for the creating the Sabbath. So this commentary says, So God spoke well of the Sabbath and good to them who conscientiously observe it. John Gill commentary says this, referring to God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, a day in which he, that's God, took delight and pleasure, having finished all his works and rested from them, and looked over them as very good. And so he pronounced this day a good and happy day, sanctified it and appointed it to be separated from the others, separate from the other days, 
for our holy service and worship. So God blessed the seventh day. He also sanctified it. Hebrew word for sanctify. Kadash means holy, sanctify, purify, make whole, consecrate. So Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary in commenting about this phrase and the use of the word sanctify, a particular distinction is placed on it, the Sabbath, above the other six days, showing it to be devoted to sacred purposes. There is a purpose. There is a proper use, proper observance of the seventh day Sabbath. The institution, continuing uh, from the commentary, the institution of the Sabbath is as old as creation. Now, how many times have you heard that the Sabbath was for the Jews or the Sabbath was created or given at Mount Sinai? The Sabbath is old as creation. This commentary says it existed long before the nation, Israel nation, giving rise to the weekly division of time. It is a wise and beneficial law affording a regular interval of rest which the physical nature of man and animals imply. Moreover, it secures an appointed season of religious worship. And if it was necessary in a state of a primeval innocence, what that's saying is if the Sabbath was in existence and needed before sin appeared, how much more now when mankind has a strong tendency to forget God and his claims? Today, without the Sabbath, man has had and has the tendency and has forgotten God. And if we do not observe the Sabbath, we too can succumb to that tendency to forget God and forget his promises. Sabbath was made for a purpose. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Let's go to verse 23. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Now it happened when he went through, this is Christ, going through the, the, grain, the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as he went, his disciples plucked, began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was in need and hungry? And he and those with him, how he went into the house of God? in the days of Baalthar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. Here's the important point that Christ makes here, verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Christ did not say the Sabbath was made for the Jews. It was made for a particular group of people. It was made for man. That is you, that's me, and that's everyone else around in society and in this world, whether they recognize it or not. The Sabbath was made for all of us. And we have been granted the privilege to understand that now. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So it was made for us. Think of the time when a loved one, maybe your children or your grandchildren, a loved one came to you and said, I made something for you. 
Mom, Dad, I made something for you. Grandpa, Grandma, I made something to you. Honey, I made something for you. Even if it was dinner, I made something for you. What does that communicate about the relationship between the person giving you the gift and you? How would you treat that gift? Would you take that gift and put it in the trash can? Would you put that gift and trample on it? No, you treasure it, no matter how small. Because it is communicating an important bond between the one giving the gift and you. The Sabbath was made for you. How are you and I treating it? Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. Now let's go to verse 12. Exodus 31, verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between you and me throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Drop down to verse 16. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Now referring back to the origin. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The principle, the Sabbath is a sign. And for us today, it must be a sign between God and us. What is a sign? Merriam-Webster Mer Dictionary defines a sign as a motion or a gesture that expresses a thought or a command or a wish. God created the Sabbath, and it is a sign between us and God. And in it, we understand God's wish. We understand his commands. A sign is also a linguistic unit. It designates an object and the relationship of that object. So if you go out there and you see a sign, it may say this sign belongs, this item belongs to someone. The Sabbath should be a sign that says we acknowledge that God has called us. Open up the truth, his truth to us, and we are his. And we take on that sign. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 20. we read of another purpose of the Sabbath. Yes, he's talking to the children of Israel, but the Sabbath existed long before the nation of Israel. So whatever principles we read about the Sabbath applies to us, because the Sabbath was made for man. Ezekiel chapter 20, just verse 12. Notice why God instructed ancient Israel to observe the Sabbath. And it's really the same reason for you and me. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me. That what? That they may know I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And it's through the Sabbath we can get to know that God has sanctified us as well. Sabbath was made for us. So why 
am I here? God created the Sabbath. It's made for you and me. It's sanctified and blessed. And he wants us to observe it because he has blessed it and sanctified it. And through it, we can know God and we can know his promises. And we can be reminded of him every single week. So let's go on to the second word in that, why am I here? We talk about why, where the Sabbath came from. Now, why am I? Why me? Well, we just read part of it in Exodus 31, verse 12. That you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. He looked down on you. And open your mind to understand the Sabbath, understand its importance, understand God's plan. And we each had to make that decision to say, yes, I understand, and yes, I will follow. Notice verse 14 of Exodus 31. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Is the Sabbath holy to me? I can't make it holy. It's God who does. But he commands me to observe the Sabbath. The Lord has sanctified me, and therefore I must keep it, for it should be holy to me. Is it holy to you? Verse 16, therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant, as a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And keep going back to the origin, origin, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Remember the Sabbath. He wants us to keep it. He wants us to keep it holy. So is the Sabbath holy to me? We each have to ask that question. And if it is holy to me, then how should I behave? What is appropriate on the Sabbath? How should I keep it? Notice something that Jesus said about the law in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Yes, we are to keep the Sabbath. It is part of God's law. And Christ did not do away with the law. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Just going to bring out one. Scripture here that some people might try to use to say that a Sabbath is done away because it's done away with the law. Matthew 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. And some would want to argue, but to fulfill means that the law is no longer in effect. Everything that's Needed to observe the law is done, and we're free from observing the law of God. But is that true? Well, let's turn back to Matthew chapter 3 and just look at the use of the word fulfill. Matthew chapter 3. Let's go to verse 15. For the same Greek word that's used fulfill in, in Matthew 5, 17, it's the same Greek word used here in Matthew 3, 15. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. But Jesus said in answer to him, so he's talking to John the Baptist, getting, about getting baptized. John the Baptist resists that. But Christ answers him, Permit it now so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. The same word. If we're going to apply the same principle as Christ saying that he's fulfilling all righteousness so no one needs to live a righteous life anymore, I don't think anyone would say that. 
Christ did not do away with the law. He did not do away with the Sabbath. He came to expound on it, to show how it is, should be applied to our lives. In other words, he magnified it. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 12 as an example. We read the corresponding scripture for this, but let's go to Matthew 12. When the disciples went through the field and plucked corn, but we're going to go down to verse 7, Matthew 12, verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would, have, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. There are some things that are perfectly permissible on the Sabbath, and there are some, some that are not. Christ shows us that way. Christ helps us to understand what's appropriate and not appropriate. Let's go over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Notice that Christ said, I'm the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Notice something about God as well. Romans 3, verse 29. For is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. The God that we serve is the God of everyone. He is interested in everyone, even those who are ignoring him today and ignoring his Sabbath today. His laws still exist. The Sabbath was created for man. It's God's gift to mankind even if mankind today does not respect it. But we know it's been given to us as a gift. Do we respect the gift of the Sabbath? Now let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So we're, so we're still considering the I and the question, why am I here? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision made of the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without, and without God in the world. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is the law of commandments containing the ordinances. Let's drop down to verse 17. And he came and preached to you who are afar off and to those who are near. Two groups of people. And he came and preached peace to you, those who are far off and those who were near, for through him we both. So those two sets of people, we both have access to one spirit in the Father. 
Today we might consider ourselves kind of two categories. One who were called out from other religions into the church and those of us who grew up in the church. Sometimes refer to first generation and then second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. This applies to both of us because through him we both, whether you grew up in the church or came into church from the outside, Christ came so that we can have access by one spirit to the Father because we all have sinned. Verse 19, now therefore we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the, prof of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building is fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being fit together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Together, we are being built as one. Our citizenry, and the feast is coming up, is reminding us to what government do we give our allegiance? It's not a government in this world, but it's government that's being headed by Jesus Christ. You can jot down Romans chapter 5, verse 8. This scripture applies to every one of us, whether we came into the church from outside or whether we grew up in the church as a second, third, fourth, or fifth generation. This scripture applies to all of us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his love towards us. That's you and that's me. And that's all of humanity. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And that created the pathway that we could be here now. That we can be here today. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. First Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So we live our lives to follow Christ's steps. We live our lives the same way Christ lived. And he observed the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. And he also showed us the appropriate ways to observe the Sabbath. So God has called us. He sanctified us. He's asked us or wants us to follow Christ because of that calling. You and I are here because of God's mercy towards us. Calling us and opening, us, opening our minds to understand his purpose for all of humanity. Not just us here in this room. But for all of humanity. And he's given us that vision. Create, Sabbath is created by God. He sanctified it. He made it holy. And he wants us to keep it that way. So then the third word in the question, why am I here? The word here. Let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23. And let's start in verse 1. 
Leviticus 23, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And in listing, what does he start with? What does he start with? Verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Holy convocation, assembly, a meeting, sometimes translated a reading, where there's an assembly and there's a reading of what? God's word. The teaching of God's word in that assembly. Some commentaries about this, this uh, phrase or this passage. Adams Clark commentary. This, referring to the Sabbath, because it is the first and greatest solemnity, is first mentioned. He who kept it not in the most religious manner is not capable of keeping any of the others. All he's saying is, it's the first listed. And if you're unable to keep that first one, how are you going to be able to keep the others? Because it's listed first, as, as far as Adam Clark's commentary goes. Schofield commentary. Sabbath. It's been consecrated, it's holy, it's set apart for a service of God. So we are to observe the Sabbath in a particular way. And part of that is have a holy convocation to meet. The Sabbath is not just a two-hour period or a three-hour period or four-hour period. Sunset to sunset. But in that period, God has said there must be or should be a holy convocation, convocation, an assembly. Now, of course, there are reasons why someone cannot come and meet. There are various legitimate reasons for that. But in the heart, the desire is to be with the other brethren, just can't be there. That is different than having a heart of saying, I am not interested in being there. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We should have a desire to be with brethren, meeting together, assembling together on the Sabbath. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 verse 23. Hebrews 10, verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For our minds have been opened, and we understand the plan of God, and we see we have that hope of a future, of a coming kingdom that will bring the peace that this world so desperately needs. We can confess that hope, and we don't waver. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some. So there's a custom. There's the, the heart is saying, I don't have to meet. We're admonished, do not fall into that mindset. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much as you see the day approaching. So we do not abandon assembling together. There's a hotel ad that kind of has the phrase that you cannot be together by staying apart. And we cannot be one body. We cannot be one body 
by staying apart. So as we ask the, the question, why am I here? We know that we have an enemy who wants us to live contrary to God's way, contrary to what God's instructions. So I have a few points of some things, some things we need to be aware of, to be conscious of, to know and be aware if we're slipping into some of these things that we're able to catch ourselves Ask God for help and get out of it. Let's turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 8. Exodus 20, verse 8. simply says or starts with, remember the Sabbath day. Remember. And many of us might say, well, I don't forget the Sabbath day. I remember when it is. Well, we have to be careful that we don't start with ignore the Sabbath day. Oh, no, I know it's the Sabbath. And I know there are certain things that are appropriate or inappropriate, but I am going to ignore it. Because ignoring the Sabbath is going to lead to forgetting the Sabbath. And we have an enemy who wants us to forget. So something to watch out for. Do not ignore the Sabbath. Do not forget the Sabbath. Another point, let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, let's go down to verse 19, Jeremiah 17, verse 19. Starting verse 19, Thus the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out in all the gates of Jerusalem. Verse 21, Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Now bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work. But hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. Verse 23. But they did not obey or incline their ears, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear or receive the instructions. We need to make sure we have the right attitude towards the Sabbath. We read here that the people here did not incline their ear, they didn't want to hear and they were stiff neck. Anyone have a stiff neck? You can't turn. You have to keep going in one direction. They did not want to turn from trampling the Sabbath. Their necks were stiff. I want to go the way I want to go. And they will not incline their ear to instruction. So we want to have the right attitude towards the Sabbath. And then a third example or third point in what we need to watch out for or make sure we have. Let's turn over to Mark 9. Mark 9. Mark 9. Let's go down to verse 20. It 
some backdrop, a man had brought his son to his disciples, and the disciples were unable to cast him out. Verse 20, then they brought him to him, brought the man and the boy to Jesus, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell to the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he, Christ, asked the father, how long has this happen, been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he will be thrown both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And he said to him, if you can believe all things are possible, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. And this would be in one of my top five scriptures of all time, at least for me. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. There are some areas we are strong in that no one is able to move us. And there are other areas that we are weak. That faith is not there. That belief is not there. And it could be in the Sabbath. Yes, I am not going to do this on the Sabbath, but there's something else I really want to do. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's attending something. I am not strong in that area. And to cry out to God and say, I believe, but I am not strong in this area. Help me keep the Sabbath the way you want me to keep it. Because I don't have the strength. We can make that plea that this man pleaded. In today's word, I would use he was authentic. He did not pretend that he had all the faith. And all the belief, he recognized that he had some unbelief. And we can go to God and say, there's something I'm struggling with. Help me. So what should we do? What's some things that we can do and consider? Well, we looked at principles, and that's what we're going to do. Look at principles. I'm not going to list here's the things you should not do, specific things, should or should not do. But here are some principles, some things to think about. What should we do? Consider making the Sabbath a delight. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, 13 to 14. It says, call the Sabbath a delight. Think about ways to make the Sabbath a delight from God's point of view. Consider physical creation. Think about the purpose of man, God's plan. Have family time together. Married couples have spent some extra time together. Busy during the whole week, Sabbath is a good time to spend some that additional time together. Visit one another, visit parents, visit grandparents, visit friends, visit brothers, visit sisters. Build the family relationship that God wants us to have. And certainly we can work on our own spiritual growth. A little bit more Bible study, a little bit more meditation. Another point is have the right kind of joy kind of a take from the first point of making the Sabbath a delight, have the right kind of joy. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 10. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You want to have the right kind of joy. 
It's connected to having the same joy that Christ had. And it's connected to keeping his commandments, which includes the Sabbath. So as we make the Sabbath a delight, we focus on having the right kind of delight or joy. Another area is to train our children in observing the Sabbath. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord. Our children are precious. Even if they are grown up, they are still precious to us, moms and dads. Our grandchildren are precious as well. They are a heritage from the Lord. And one of the blessings of those children born into a believing home, even if one is a believing and the other one is not, as we read in 1 Corinthians 7, is that they can have that special relationship with God. How do they see the Sabbath? How do they see you observe the Sabbath? What advice did you give to them in observing the Sabbath? All families are different, different circumstances, but what is the principle? The principle is I am a parent, and to some extent a grandparent. How do I model keeping the Sabbath? What do they see? What answers can I give? What answers do I give when they have a question about the Sabbath? Another area we can look at is planning for the Sabbath in advance. Plan for the Sabbath in advance. What are we going to wear? Don't want to wait 30 minutes before it's time to leave to try to figure out what we're going to wear. We can plan ahead. Get our Bibles and notebooks ready. Make sure our electronic devices are charged, have enough power in them if we use electronic devices. We check the schedule where service is going to be at. Service is going to be at. Some of us may have experienced where we turn up at a place where we thought service was going to be and it moved somewhere else. Think of the messages ahead of time. Pray for the speakers. Pray that you get to hear what you need so that you can grow spiritually. Some of us are part of the lineup for Sabbath services. We are sound leaders. Pick the sounds ahead of time. Share them with the musicians. If there are teen studies, Sabbath school, prepare ahead of time. Make sure our transportation is taken care of, it's fueled, clean, ready to go. And we plan to leave services on time so that we can get here on time. Plan for the Sabbath services and plan for the Sabbath overall in advance. Another point is to get the most out of Sabbath services. Get the most out of Sabbath services. When my brothers and I would go to a party, we would try to get there early, and we'd be one of the last to leave. Why? We were going to squeeze everything out of that party that we could get. We didn't want to leave early, and we didn't want to arrive late. We should be willing and planning as much as we can to get here on time before services start, and that we're seated when the message goes out to find our seats, and we're ready to get most out of the Sabbath services. And then we're ready to fellowship afterwards or even before. We're willing to fellowship. We're ready to praise God. We come before, humbly before God as one people, one body. And we also look out for visitors. You look out for those who may be new, who may be visiting, and we greet them, and we make them welcome. Let's turn over to Daniel chapter 1. We live in a world with all sorts of distractions, all sorts of challenges, 
And Daniel had a certain mindset which helped him, I believe, and will help us if we have that same mindset. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is taken captive by the Babylonians. And we read a statement as he's taken into the court. We read this statement in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacy. He purposed in his heart. He set his heart to do something before the condition presented itself. Do you think the Babylonians really cared what Daniel wanted to eat or not eat? Do you think that when the Babylonians took captives, they interviewed all the captives and asked, what do you prefer us to do? how do you prefer us to treat you? But Daniel purposed in his mind to live a certain way. And because of that purpose, he's able to respond. And that should be us today. We should purpose in our minds to keep the Sabbath. Why? Because we will be tested. Something will come up at work. Something will come up at school. Something will come up in the neighborhood. Something will come up with family who don't understand the way we live. And if we have not purposed in our hearts to keep the Sabbath, it might be a little easier to compromise. And as we read back in Mark 9, we know that we can have weaknesses and we can cry out to God and say, help my unbelief. As I begin to wrap up here, the associate pastor in the West Michigan area, Mr. Chris Moyne, he gave a sermon several weeks back about the Sabbath itself as well. And he talked about principles. He started with a list of questions, and I wrote him and asked him if it's okay I could use these questions, and he gave me permission. So I'm kind of closing my message with his beginning of his message. But he talked about, as he started, that he taught several classes at Camp Woodman, a teen camp in Alabama. I'm not sure how long that was. And he started off by asking questions relating to the principles of observing the Sabbath. So I want to read some of those questions because these are questions we all can face. And, and, and how do you answer those? Well, it's based on that answering the question, why am I here? Here's some of his questions. Is it okay on the Sabbath to shoot some baskets with my friends before sunset? or play a ball game on Friday night? Is it okay on the Sabbath to go for a short swim on Friday evening or Saturday afternoon after church, or to lay out by the poolside and tan for three hours? Is it okay on the Sabbath to play a Bible board game with a family, with family on Friday nights? or play video games alone for hours? Is it okay on the Sabbath to listen to uplifting music after mom and dad have gone to bed or go to a Friday night dance? Is it okay on the Sabbath to watch a Bible video or a positive nature video or to watch TV for hours? And if so, what kind of programs? Is it okay to read a Bible? or to read a novel on the Sabbath? Is it okay to work a few minutes after sundown if there's an urgent need on your job, or work two hours after sundown if there's an urgent need on your job? Is it okay to pick a few vegetables out of the garden, fresh vegetables out of the garden for a Saturday evening dinner? or harvest all the ripe tomatoes on the vine on a Sabbath? Is it okay to milk a cow on the Sabbath 
Is it okay to buy gas for the car on the Sabbath? Is it okay to make cards and get well cards for others on the Sabbath? He didn't answer those questions. And I'm not going to answer those questions. The reason why is that the answer has to be up to you. And the answer has to be based off of this question, why am I here? Wherever here is. So here could be here in this building. Or if I'm in a parking lot at an amusement park waiting for the Sabbath to end, same question, why am I here? If I'm somewhere else, wherever, the same question on the Sabbath, why am I here? So let's turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your sons, nor your daughter, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It might not be a grocery store where you stop in your track and ask, what am I here? What am I here for? But I hope from time to time on a Sabbath, you will reflect on why you are keeping the Sabbath, why you are observing the Sabbath, and you will go back to the beginning, God's purpose for the Sabbath. And you will reflect on God's calling, calling you to understand His truth and understand what the Sabbath pictures. And that you would reflect how a great joy it is to be among brethren, to assemble together to inspire one another to good works and to be taught from God's word. The Sabbath was made for man, made for all of us. How do you and I view the Sabbath? Is it a blessing? Why are you here? Why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? If we continue to discern the proper way to keep and observe the Sabbath as Christ would and God wants us to, we will answer that question by saying, oh, now I remember, now I know why I am here. And the Sabbath will be and will continue to be a joy and a delight.